We are excited this segment to welcome Josh Pate. He is the host of the popular college football show, Late Kick Live. He was in Knoxville a week ago visiting with Tennessee head coach Josh Heupel, other people around the program. Josh, we appreciate you taking time to join us. And I'm curious, what were your takeaways talking to Josh Heupel, being around people at the University of Tennessee in town last week? Well, there's a ton of construction. That was the first thing I took away. So there are as many cranes on the campus of Tennessee as there are in downtown Nashville, where I live. And that's saying something, by the way. So it's it's this fight that you have major levels of college athletics to keep up, or not just keep up, but in Tennessee's case, try and stay ahead of the curve. Um, I always love talking to Heifel because I think there's probably no coach and no system it's more misunderstood nationally than Josh Heifel, Tennessee, the offense he runs. So I always love teeing those things up for him. And, um, you know, for example, like, I, and I feel to a certain degree Kiffin's this way at Ole Miss as well. If you just ask a normal fan in Omaha, Nebraska, hey, tell me about the Tennessee Josh Heifel offense. They would just say, oh, it's a shot offense. They throw the ball all over the place. And then you look at the numbers at the end of the year, and it's weighted towards the run, and they got like a 2,500-yard uh, rushing statistic in the category. You can set your watch to it. And I love watching his teeth just like start to grit before you even finish the question. So I took that away. I took away defensively. They feel better than a lot of the places I've been. They take pride in how they've upgraded their defensive recruiting, um, their development. Like some of the first things people say in the building when you're talking is not, hey, wait do you see Nico. They do say that. But it's not that. It's, hey, we're, we're a little bit better defensively probably than people are giving us credit for. So, you know, we're, we're entering a 12-team playoff era. And not that Tennessee couldn't have made a run at a four-teamer, but in the 12-team era, uh, they are one of a few teams. Penn State's another one like this that all of a sudden is on the quote-unquote playoff radar every year. And I'm not sure the nation's ready to start thinking about Tennessee in those terms yet, but they need to be. Josh, a lot of excitement here in Knoxville about the 2024 season. Season tickets are sold out. Uh, 2022 was a unbelievable season for Tennessee, going 10-2 uh, and two last year, losing four games. Where do you see this year's team kind of standing in between those two years, more towards 10-2 and two or more towards 9-4? Uh, and four? I think they're more towards the caliber of what the 2022 team was. I don't know what win loss record that ends up giving. They could go undefeated for all I know, mm -hmm. or they could be nine and three. Um, look, there's no need to overthink the room on this stuff. When you got it at quarterback, and they think they got it at quarterback, and they've upgraded, I think year over year at the receiver position as well. And we just talked about defense. When you've got that, you got a chance in every game, and they'll be favored in most of the games they play. So, like I. I just think about some of the circle moments on the schedule this year in the SEC. One of those circle moments to me is that Saturday, I think it's week three or maybe week four, that trip to Oklahoma. Um, that's a game that for Heupel is ultra personal for reasons everyone listening to this understands. But he goes back to Oklahoma and they go in there and that's a very, very hostile road trip. But it's also the kind of situation where like Tennessee, I think is the better football team in that matchup. And so it's one thing to be able to win at home, but I, the past couple of years we talked about it with Tennessee. Can they go on the road and, and get the job done? And, uh, man, if they, if they were to do that, if they were to pull off that win there and then go into the bye week, at that point it's game on. Because at that point you kind of got your proof of performance, and you, at that point we're three or four games in and we've seen what Nico's going to do and we've seen whether we're right about that defense or not. <clears throat> my, my, I tend to believe, that they're going to be a contender throughout. And you guys know this, but I don't think the rest of the country understands. They got those big games on the schedule, and I count the game at Oklahoma as one of those. Then you got Bama a little bit later in the season. They go to Georgia. But those things are spaced out so perfectly. If you've got to play those games, they're spaced out so perfectly where you've got kind of a, a three-part check-in in terms of national championship contention that you'll do. And it may very well be that the team we see – September 21st against Oklahoma looks way different than the one you see in like week 10 or so against Georgia in mid-November. We're talking to Josh Pate from Late Kick. You can watch on YouTube, podcast the show as well. He was in Knoxville a week ago talking to Josh Heupel. 
with the speaker series, and you've you've mentioned Nico a couple of times and the the potential with him and the offense. What, what kind of vibes did you get in what was being said, talked about, whether it was Josh Heupel or anybody else within the program talking about Nico, who of course enters this year with wild expectations based on everything leading up to this point? Yeah, what I've learned going across the country is when we're talking about high level quarterbacks in the NIL era, everyone says the right things about him on air. You can gauge how people really feel about him in the building by how they talk about him off the record and off air. And I'm not saying anyone's out there dogging their quarterback, but a lot of them understand there may be a lot of drama around their guy. Um, It was a a heavy NIL situation that got him there, so it's strictly transactionally kind of a mercenary relationship. So it stands out, like when I was at Tennessee last week, like Nico's a high-profile guy. Nico can earn a lot of money. And he's got every reason to have sort of those diva traits about him. And he has none of that. And they go out of their way to make sure you understand that this dude is a, is a big-time player. A lot's expected of him. He gets it. But from a neck-up perspective, uh, Heifel told me we couldn't wire him any better. Like, we, we couldn't hope to have wired him any better mentally. Doesn't mean he's going to be perfect. Like, he'll make mistakes. But he's made of the right stuff. And it doesn't matter – if the guy's got the physical attributes, which we couldn't coach either, if he didn't have what Nico has mentally, we may have a mess on our hands. He said, instead, we've got a shot to do everything we want to do as long as we keep him healthy. You got an opportunity to, to uh, connect with some of the current players while you were uh, in town and on campus. Who are some of those guys, and what were your impressions from your visit? Yeah, I went over to Peyton's place over there at the graduate. And I I don't know how many other places do what Tennessee does, but, like, I think think it's pretty awesome. I went and and talked to Omari Thomas, for example, on the the Players podcast they do there. And that's really interesting because, number one, I mean, it's what the game's about anyway. Like, that's who we're we're ultimately paid to to, to talk about anyway. That's what this whole thing revolves around. So it's nice to see – you know, someone using football. I had, I had a coach tell me the other day who was a former player, I wish I would have used football as much as it used me when I was in college. I thought I was using it, but I wasn't really using it. And then you fast forward a few years, and you're looking at guys like Omari. You're playing football for the University of Tennessee, but if you claim to want to get into broadcasting, I mean, you've got bottomless resources at your disposal and you've got really big brand rub and recognition because you play for Tennessee use it and those guys are using it and so I had a lot of fun going over there and working with those guys and talking to them I think that's a model uh, probably what Tennessee's doing there that a lot of other places will look to emulate in the coming years I know a few already have I think that'll proliferate a whole lot more Josh Pate from late kick so going into this year it's the 12 team playoff Tennessee's hoping to be a contender planning on being a contender at least right going into the season how deep is that race of sec teams that are going to have a legitimate chance if things go the right way to be in that conversation heading to november what are the margins from school to school in that conversation yeah i like the way you worded that and especially in spring and summer because the teams that can have a shot at a 12 team playoff if everything falls right is over half the conference um it's if everything goes right. That's the key part of that phrase. So if you believe, like I do, that the best way to predict seasons is best case, worst case, and most likely, well, forget about most likely and worst case. We're talking about pure best case situations here. Well, Georgia and Alabama, you know, those, those guys are obviously in, in their best cases. But Tennessee's in there. Ole Miss is in there. LSU's in there. Guys, there's a world where A&M is in there with the quarterback play they may have this year. Uh, Texas is in there. So in the best of cases, which obviously won't pan out for maybe anyone, but certainly all of them, yeah, a lot of them have a shot, which which makes it all the more interesting because, as we know, that's, that's how fan bases, that's how Preview Magazine likes to make you think, best case, best case, best case. No one will get hurt. You'll get all the bounces. You'll win turnover margin. Well, when it doesn't happen and you miss out on a 12-team playoff instead of just a four-teamer, how shorter is the leash? How shorter is the patience level on average amongst fan bases? Because, yeah, you got a 12-team playoff. The trade-off is it also happens to coincide with this conference getting much deeper and more difficult. You could say the same thing about the Big Ten. So it's a new era in about 15 different ways in college football, but that's one frontier that I'm 
I'm really interested to see us tackle over the coming five years or so. Josh, last thing, we'll get you out of here. There's also the big picture conversations that are happening around college football, the NIL space, revenue sharing, all that. How quickly do you think things are moving forward to whatever the next big steps will be in the financial conversation of college football with schools, with conferences, with athletes? As fast as they possibly can. Um, Faster than I think we've seen anything move in college football. I think fans probably just get tired of the minutia. They want someone to tell them, what does this mean? And I, here's where I think we're headed, and write this in very light pencil. Where I think we're headed, however it gets constructed, is revenue sharing from the conference level with football players. All right, now, if I'm a fan, I'm listening and I'm saying, okay, well, what does that really change? Yeah, the players have money in their pocket, but I'm tired of watching players go all over the place, and it's not hypocritical because I'm also tired of watching coaches go all over the place. How do we finally get some consistency in this sport? Well, to me, the answer is not to try and – get laws passed that are just going to get taken to court and thrown out. You can't be making guys stay on a roster. You can't be making guys not transfer. What you can do is use your revenue sharing structure to heavily incentivize guys remaining on the roster for a long period of time. And when you toss around 15 or 20 million per year in the SEC or the Big Ten, I think what that looks like is a freshman earning a little bit, but that sophomore earning a little bit more, and when he becomes a junior and a senior, earning more and more contingent on him remaining on the same roster. That doesn't mean you can't transfer. It doesn't mean it's illegal. It does mean you kind of hit a reset button from your revenue-sharing standpoint if you do choose to transfer. And I think that's probably the way you alleviate a lot of the problems, not all of them, but a lot of the problems that we're seeing right now. I mean, I've got, I got head coaches telling me, hey, we're not complaining. We'd just like to know who's going to be on our team year to year. Josh, where can people, what's the best way for people to find your work? Well, if you like the video format, YouTube is the best place. Late Kick with Josh Pate. If you're a podcast type, that's fine. The show is also in any podcast feed where you listen. It's uh, Late Kick with Josh Pate. And so however you want to consume it, we try and we try and bring it to you however you want it. Well, we were glad you were able to make the trip over to Knoxville. Glad you had a good time in town last week. Thanks so much for taking time to join us here today. Hopefully we can do it again soon. Absolutely, guys. I always appreciate it.